Hi there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. So, if the aliens, the aliens, the aliens, the aliens were to approach the outer edge of our solar system today, what would our response be? Well, first, the greatest minds on our planet would most likely come together and figure out some way to stop the approaching threat before it gets close enough to do actual damage to our planet. The conversation would eventually lead to a discussion about preemptive strike measures. A war fought in our our orbit or on the surface of our planet will do irreparable damage to our local infrastructure and cities. If we've learned anything from our forays into the Warhammer 40k universe or the Battle of Reach from the Halo series. But what would that preemptive strike be? What is the most powerful weapon at humanity's disposal? Thermal lasers? No, not really. Rail guns? Perhaps. Nicolas Cage in a bear suit? Most definitely, but will he be able to survive for long periods of time in space without oxygen? No, the real answer, as humanity found out in the movie Armageddon and in the less exciting movie Deep Impact, which was arguably a better film, was a nuclear weapon of some sort, usually delivered by excellent strong-willed men like Bruce Willis or Robert Duvall, men who were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for humanity. And at least in this case, fiction mirrors reality. Our best option for a preemptive strike against some kind of extraterrestrial threat would be exactly that, a hero of humanity riding a nuclear weapon. But how exactly do nukes work in space? It's a perplexing idea that we probably don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's something that films routinely get wrong in their portrayal. And I'm not talking about Spartans delivering an MFDD into the belly of a Covenant beast, or Tom Cruise using Scientology and Morgan Freeman's corpse to deliver a nuke to destroy the Tet from within. I'm talking about detonating a nuke in the vacuum of space without any kind of medium for the energy blast to travel through. I mean, that is the big thing, isn't it? Our atmosphere plays a huge role in how energy is transferred on Earth, and without it, things drastically change when it comes to explosions. Now, from 1945 to 1992, the United States tested over 1,054 nuclear weapons on the surface of our planet. During the same period of time, the Soviet Union tested an additional 715 nuclear weapons. Many other nuclear-capable na- Am I saying it right, dude? Is it nuclear? No, you've messed it up about three times. Really? Yeah. What is it? I'm very cognizant of this because I always- what, how, how do you pronounce it? Nuclear. Nuclear. No, dude, you see- it, Nuclear? No. Say it. Nuclear. Nuclear. I thought that was the wrong way to do it. Many other nuclear-capable nations during this period of time also tested their own weapons. First of all, what the hell, humanity? What were you thinking? Second of all, out of the thousands of tests that we did conduct, a few of them were actually done in outer space. And we only did a few because, as we'll find out, it's not really the best idea. You see, in 1962, well, first, let's just note that the 60s were a crazy time for Americans, and especially the American government. Our military intelligence services did a lot of really crazy and abhorrent stuff. That, in hindsight, is probably the reason why so many conspiracy theorists today believe that our government is capable of some really terrible things. And they've got, like, astronaut-level people taking super hardcore levels of drugs and going into meetings with these things and making intergalactic deals. You had stuff like Operation Northwoods, a proposed false flag attack where Cuban terror cells trained by the US government and the CIA would carry out attacks against soft civilian targets in the United States in order to justify the United States declaring war against Cuba. JFK rejected the proposal and conspiracy theorists claim today that it's one of the reasons why he was assassinated. Then you had stuff like the controversial Gulf of Tonkin incident that was used to launch the United States into a so-called defensive war against North Vietnam. Then you had the CIA's MK Ultra program where they tried to create LSD and ketamine-fueled Jedi warriors, which is actually kind of cool. And to add to that list of crazy things, the US government was testing all sorts of different type of nuclear weapons with a disregard for the safety of civilians that just happened to be in the area. Then you had Operation Fishbowl, which was at high altitude nuclear tests carried out by the US military to study the effects of nuclear weapons high in the atmosphere and eventually in vacuum. Operation Fishbowl was further broken into three different types of tests known as Bluegill, Starfish, and Uraka. These three nuclear tests would all be carried by the Thor ballistic missile, which would be launched from the Johnston Atoll, an uninhabited island used by the US government for all sorts of crazy stuff, including the storage of Agent Orange, Mustard Gas, Agent VX, Anthrax, the T-Virus, and whatever made Gary Busey. The PGM-17 Thor was one of the first intermediate-range ballistic missiles ever developed and had a relatively high failure rate by modern-day standards of around 25%. This meant the first Bluegill test and Starfish test both failed because the launch vehicle failed. The Bluegill test was designed to see what effect a nuke would have at 30-80 kilometers above the surface of the planet, 
And the Starfish test was designed to see what effects a nuke would have over 80 kilometers over the surface of the planet. At around 90 kilometers above the surface of the planet is the thermosphere. The gases here are so thin that the aerodynamic control surfaces on an airplane stop working, which is why many consider this as the border for outer space. At around the 100 kilometer point is the Kármán line, where the speed needed to maintain altitude is the same as escape velocity. The Kármán line is also what most international space agencies consider the border of space. If you've crossed this line, you can officially call yourself an astronaut on all future job applications. So while the first two tests failed, the third one known as Starfish Prime did manage to succeed. On July 9th, 1962, a Thor missile carried a 1.4 megaton warhead, roughly 100 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb, into the thermosphere and detonated at an altitude of 400 kilometers above the surface of the planet, roughly the same altitude that the ISS is now orbiting at. First, the visual aspect. Without any atmosphere to restrain the blast, there was no telltale mushroom cloud. Instead, the explosion erupted into a sphere. There was also a visible shockwave because at this altitude, it was still low enough for gases and the atmosphere to serve as a medium for the blast to travel through. As a matter of fact, even space and vacuum still has a few particles, enough to allow some kind of shockwave to develop, usually. Although the shockwave would be far less devastating than one created in the dense atmosphere of a planet. So from what we can tell, that part of a nuclear weapon's blast will be mitigated in space somewhat. Immediately after, the explosion created a massive aurora, as it bombarded our upper atmosphere with fast-moving electrons. This glow was seen thousands of kilometers away. The incredibly fast-moving electrons also created an electromagnetic field, also known as an EMP. This would go on to disable all highly sensitive electronic equipment in the nearby area that was not shielded. All over the Hawaiian island chain, which was around a thousand miles away from the blast, street lights were knocked out and car alarms were set off. Other sensitive equipment like a telephone company's microwave link was completely disabled. The EMP pulse that was recorded was far larger than anyone expected. At such altitudes without obstruction from atmosphere, fast moving gamma rays were able to spread out across a wider range before creating an EMP. Scientists later estimated that if a nuke of a similar size was detonated over Kansas at the same altitude as Starfish Prime, the EMP pulse would be large enough to cover the entire continental United States. The size of the EMP surpassed the expectations of the military and suddenly made high altitude detonations like this a very viable offensive weapon. But perhaps the most damaging aspect of this high altitude explosion was the amount of radiation that was trapped within the Earth's magnetic field. Without the Earth's atmosphere to reduce the spread of radiation, the Starfish Prime test created a massive radiation belt which disabled six satellites as they passed through it, including one Soviet one. Again, the radiation belt, just like the EMP pulse, was expected but far larger than scientists had originally thought it would be. The results were crazy enough that future tests, including the Bluegill tests in Operation Fishbowl, were conducted with far smaller nuclear devices that were only a few kilotons in yield instead of the gigantic 1.4 megaton device used for Starfish Prime. The next test in Operation Fishbowl was Bluegill Prime, and it exploded on the launch pad, which spelled an end to the Operation Fishbowl project. The third higher altitude portion of Operation Fishbowl was also canceled due to concerns from Starfish Prime's results. That part of the test was designated Uraka and was originally supposed to be carried out at an altitude of a thousand kilometers using a one megaton device. After Starfish Prime, it was just deemed way too dangerous to actually carry out. A few months after Starfish Prime, the Soviets carried out a similar test, including launching a 300 kiloton warhead and detonating it at an altitude of 290 kilometers. The detonation fused 570 kilometers worth of telephone lines and set a power plant in Karaganda on fire, completely destroying it. The partial test ban treaty was passed just a year later, and in 1967, the Outer Space Treaty was signed by the United States and Soviet Union, followed by dozens of other countries, banning the placement of nuclear weapons in space. Which, strangely enough, would have banned the use of the nukes we tried to detonate in space in Armageddon, Deep Impact. Also, there's that excellent film, Sunshine, where we try to reignite the sun with a nuke. So clearly, in the event of an alien invasion, uh, using nuclear weapons in close orbit would probably be a last resort and not very likely to be one of our first options. Depending on the quantity and power of these weapons, such an attack could compromise Earth's defensive grid and communications network. Compared to their use in atmosphere, nukes in near orbit would create a larger EMP pulse and radiation belt. But at the same time, with less air and gases to travel through and serve as a medium, the initial thermal flash and shock wave which makes up a huge percentage of the transference of energy from a nuclear explosion, would be greatly limited in vacuum. 
This means a nuke in space would actually go from being an area effect weapon to something that would have to literally strike its target or explode pretty damn close to its target to completely annihilate or vaporize it. The EMP pulse and radiation that follows it will be a severe problem for anyone in the battlefield. It'll definitely be a problem for any space forces from Earth, and depending on the technological level of the aliens that we face, it might be a problem for them as well. So while near our own planet and satellite network, launching nukes and aliens might be a bad idea, with a proper guidance system, I can definitely see us using these type of weapons in parts of space that we don't mind polluting with EMP pulses and radiation. The power of a nuclear explosion is still by far one of the most powerful weapons we have at our disposal. Well, at least until we harness the power of Tom Cruise in a synthetic form. <laughs> the best case scenario if we do encounter an alien fleet is to do what the Spartans did, or as Will Smith and Jeff Goldwyn did in Independence Day, and literally deliver a tactical nuke with a smaller yield directly into a ship and detonate it from within. Inside the confines of a pressurized hull, a small nuclear weapon would be almost overkill. But hey, it's always a good idea to send a strong message to the Xenos when it comes to first contact. Well, there you have it, guys. That's what would happen if we launched a nuke in space and actually detonated it. If it's close to Earth, it would be a terrifying thing to see, and I hope it never happens again, at least in my lifetime. And as always, the, the lesson here is to make sure you detect the aliens before they really get close to your home planet and destroy them in the cold embrace of space before they get into near orbit. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button for more awesome content. My name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.